All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to talk about first cardiology experience with this COVID-19 situation we have on our hands. So as many of you know, we are approved for high level care, this intensive care uh, of the patients. So far, we have had 20 admissions and um, all of them had either pneumonia or ARDS to, to come into the ICU. Uh, we haven't had the opportunity of looking after the not so ill ones. So our patient experiences with the very ill people. So um, 20 admissions and so far five deaths and uh, five still in hospital. So uh, 10 have been discharged, five did not make it and there are five are still in hospital. And of one of those five, one is very critically ill on um, non-invasive ventilation. So unfortunately, I couldn't get slides together, but let me go through what uh, we had. Now, of all those 20 admissions, every single one of them had at least one comorbidity. The commonest comorbidity was hypertension, followed by diabetes. Um, they were all, like I said, admitted for pneumonia seven with ARDS. Of the five, uh, and five of those deaths came from the seven with ARDS. Um, now, the patients who died, the mortality, there are some consistent findings amongst them. Number one, I would like to mention in our own little experience is all of them had vitamin D deficiency. Every single one of them that died and all that went on the ventilator, all who got very ill were vitamin D deficient. We routinely take um, up to vitamin D levels in our patients. Then they all had hypertension and they all had diabetes and they were all obese. Those were the comorbidities of the, uh, those are the comorbidities of the uh, patients who died. Um, a couple of them had renal failure before they came in. Um, and then one had metastatic prostate CA. Um, of the four, of the five mortalities, five were on the ventilator. One was not vented, mainly because uh, he was a DNR, did not resuscitate, he was a D7, had metastatic prostate CA. So we, uh, we treated him the best way we, can, we could without a um, being too aggressive, but unfortunately, his kidney function got worse and uh, essentially died of kidney failure. Now, um, the, average, the range of age was 42 to 92. Interestingly, the three patients above the age of 90 survived. And uh, the interesting thing is those three patients at, uh, who were 90 had no comorbidities I mean, did not have hypertension, did not have diabetes. One of them had dementia and um, the other two were otherwise healthy. One of them developed a stroke from the COVID, but all that resolved. So it's interesting that um, the virus seems to not be able to affect the 90 year olds as much as the, the rest of us. Now, the ages of those who died, 67, 64, 69, 65, and 87. 87 year old was the one with metastatic prostate CA. And um, the rest all had diabetes and hypertension and were all obese. Uh, so those were the main uh, comorbidities. Now, um, let me say, okay, let me start with our protocol, what we do for all the patients. When they come in, there's a routine assessment, physical exam. Uh, we do blood gases on everybody who comes in. That's mainly because all our patients are hypoxic on admission. 
So we do a routine blood gas, and then we start with nasal cannula oxygen, two to six liters. That's what we generally start with. Aim to keep the the oxygen saturation above 85. Normally, you want to aim above 90, but in these patients, they seem to tolerate a low oxygen saturation uh, more than most. And um, you want to not give as much oxygen as you, I mean, you want to reduce the amount of oxygen you give because long-term oxygen itself can cause damage. So they all start with nasal cannula. They all put on a, on a um, regimen of drugs, which includes the retrovirals, Ritinovir, Lopinovir, and we've added ribavirin because there's a recent study that showed the combination of the triple antivirals and interferon B1 reduced the, uh, the, the length of stay in hospital and uh, improved their prognosis. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get interferon B1 in Nigeria, at least not yet. So we said, well, we use the retrovirus plus the ribavirin. So everybody gets that. Everybody gets azithromycin. Everybody gets vitamin C, zinc. And um, those who are deficient in vitamin D get vitamin D. We check vitamin D levels on everybody. If you're not deficient, we don't, we don't give you vitamin D. So like I said, we start with the nasal cannula. And um, if that doesn't improve, we up the rate to about six liters per minute. If that doesn't work, then we go on to a non-rebreather mask. So non-rebreather mask, just to refresh your memories, those of you who are not in the clinical scenario, gives you almost 100% uh, FiO2. And uh, so we use non-invasive, I mean, non-rebreather mask as the next level. And that goes at about 10 liters per minute. Now, usually you would want to go to high flow nasal cannula. Now, high flow means about 30, 15 to 30 liters a minute. So it's really high flow. We don't have that. We're trying to get into the country. It's not here, but you can imagine it requires a lot of oxygen. So you can't use one oxygen tank and think you'll get by with it. You'll need a lot of oxygen, probably an oxygen generating um, the tank. So you go to high flow oxygen. That doesn't work go to the um, non-rebreather mask. Now, when that doesn't work, then you know you're getting into trouble. By then, the patient has usually developed ARDS. I'll go into the ARDS in detail a little bit. So when that doesn't work, we now go to what is called non-invasive ventilation, which is the two modes for that, CPAP and BiPAP. Uh, we tend to use the CPAP mode more because there's less aerosolization of, of, uh, from the patient. So we tend to use CPAP more. And um, many of them get away with CPAP. But when CPAP doesn't work, they either get tired, you can't oxygenate them anymore, they start to go into total respiratory failure, then you have to intubate. And this is where the controversy is because as all of us know, mortality once you intubate is very high. Now the question is, is it the ventilation that's causing damage or is it that by the time you get to that stage, you're already in uh, dire straits and things are quite bad? Difficult to say, but I experience with ventilation too has not been good. It hasn't been good at all. And um, what we do, there are three of us, so-called senior doctors who look after these patients, myself, the Dr. Ishola and um, Dr. Guyaki. And when we have patients on the vent, we are up all night. It is, it, you cannot understand how difficult it is to look after a COVID patient on the vent. It is probably the hardest thing, most complicated thing I've done in my professional career. So what we do, we have everybody on close monitoring. We have them on CCTV. And then we have a camera focused on the ventilator settings and on the um, monitor. So you can see the vitals throughout the night. So you go home, you've got your iPad on and you're monitoring these patients because the younger doctors who are in the ICU don't have that experience. So neither do the nurses. And uh, so you need somebody who's been around to keep an eye on these things. And um, 
you'd be surprised how things change quite rapidly, very, very rapidly. So um, once they're on the fence, they have that very tight monitoring. Now, some important things you might need to know, uh, those of us who want to go into this ICU business with these patients, you need to monitor them closely, whether or not they're on the ventilator. Once they come in with the pneumonia, they can suddenly turn around on you. You can be talking to a patient, turn around, come back, he has died. It is dramatic the way they suddenly decompensate. So please do not take them lightly. Have constant monitoring. They have to have a continuous uh, pulse oximeter on. And you'll be surprised you're talking to somebody, he's 398, you come back, he's down to 40, and you don't know why, then you have to start resuscitating and doing all those things. So they need very close monitoring, very, very close monitoring. Now, after ventilation, there's another level called ECMO, which is extra corporal membranous oxygenation. Um, that's also very, very advanced uh, care. What it does, it, it bypasses the lungs. So it's like a heart-lung machine. The heart-lung machine bypasses the lungs and oxygenates the patient. This one can bypass the lungs or it can bypass the heart or it can bypass both. But for COVID, we use it basically to bypass the lungs. So you can rest the lungs and uh, put the ventilation settings very low so while the lungs heal. Now we haven't had too much experience with it. We've only been able to use it on one patient. And unfortunately, that patient did not make it. And you can imagine how expensive it is to use this device. Just the consumables for that the, uh, device, just buying the consumables from China costs about $8,000 for one patient. And that is just the consumables that come with the machine, the cannulas, the oxygenator, and things like that. Then you have to do blood gases almost every four hours, sometimes every hour. And blood gases are expensive. So it is a very expensive machine. You have to put them on food heparinization. And you have to check ACTs regularly. Uh, so this gets very complex. So the best thing is for them not to get to that stage. How to prevent it, I don't know. But I do know this. We do CT scans on everybody that comes in. And you can almost always tell from the CT scan who is going to give you trouble and who is probably going to get away um, and be discharged home. Now, I don't have the pictures here, but I can describe it to you. If you have a CT scan that involves the infiltrates involve less than 30% of the lungs, that patient is likely to escape. All right. But if you have a CT scan where 80% of the lungs are already affected, they're all white, the damage is extensive. It is very extensive. And then those are the ones that tend not to make it. Now, why it picks some people to get so bad and some others not, I don't know. Because we all have patients who are diabetic, who are hypertensive, who don't get that sick. So I'm not sure what it is about the virus that it decides who is going to, who is going to um, get very ill, but we don't know. Now, one important thing that I have tried to understand is the cytokine storm. Um, at least in theory, the cytokine storm uh, comes after the infection, then it's a surge in cytokines, and then you get all these metabolic derangements. And that is where, if you can break the cycle, you might turn things around. Now, the thing is, with all our patients that got very ill, we know they had a cytokine storm, but we couldn't tell exactly when it started. It was very difficult to tell when it started because you see the CRP going up, then the other markers like ferritin, LDH going down. And next thing you see CRP is normal, then the other ones go up. So you don't know when it starts. But with all of them who got sick, they first got better. Everything was looking fine. We were talking about discharge, taking them off the ventilator. Then suddenly things just started to go back. And I will say all of them that died all ended up with kidney failure, ARDS. And they all ended up with kidney failure. Every single one of them had kidney failure. Now, if that was just from the sepsis, the shock, or it's part of the disease, it's difficult to say. But our colleagues who take, a lot, who take care of a lot more patients abroad say it's part of the uh, disease. There's this clotting that goes on. And then talking about clotting, 
that's part of the pathophysiology of this disease. There is a lot. Uh, all of them who have had autopsy have microthrombi in their lungs and in their kidneys and in most of the blood vessels. So we put everybody on clexane, full dose clexane. And um, in spite of that, you still have problems. Uh, so it is a very difficult disease. Um, I can tell you with the ECMO, the patient we put on ECMO, it taught us quite a bit about what goes on. Because you find that at the beginning, you require massive doses of heparin to increase the ACT to a therapeutic range. Then within 24 hours, all of a sudden, the patient has gone into DIC. So the ACT is very elevated. The APTT is elevated without any anticoagulation. So they go from one extreme to the other. And then it's now difficult to decide how to do it. If you give too much heparin, they start to bleed in their lungs. If you don't give any more heparin, they get more blood clots. So once they get to the stage of intubation, it is a very, very difficult thing to manage. And I don't think anybody has the answer yet. Now we do have a patient now, our sickest patient, um, when he came in, we noticed, like I said, we do all this blood, all this blood work. We check the CRP, we check the ferritin, we check the t dimer we check the LGH. LGH, we don't get back immediately. All, all the others, we can get back within 30 minutes. And this patient, the uh, d dimer was very elevated. Ferritin was about 1,000. And CRP was about 100, 150. Okay, now a lot of these patients, their CRP goes a lot higher than that. So his ECG also demonstrated right ventricular enlargement, new right bundle branch block. We compared it with his old ECG, which was completely normal. Troponin was slightly elevated. And then we did an echo, which showed pulmonary hypertension. So based on all this, we decided that, okay, this patient definitely had pulmonary embolism. Now, as you know, these patients are too sick to take for CT, PA, gram, and, you know, it's difficult to take a patient who's on CPAP and move him up and down in the ambulance, go to another facility who would rather not do a COVID patient and all that. So we use that as indirect evidence of um, pulmonary embolism. And we started him on thrombolytic therapy, uh, TPA. Now, because we have experienced these patients bleeding as well, we gave half the dose of uh, thrombolytic therapy. So it was 50 milligrams of ultibase we gave over two hours, as opposed to the usual dose, which is 100 milligrams. And interestingly, the patient improved, not too dramatically, but his um, PO2 went up from the low 90s to the high 90s. His heart rate came down from 120 to about 80, and his respiratory rate came down from 50 to about 45. So there was some improvement. We debated giving him the full dose, but we were all too scared that we might cause more trouble in the long run. So we took that as some mild sign, uh, mild, some minor success, and then we put him on full dose clexane. And uh, he has been improving since. Then today, like I'm talking to you about cytokine storm and everything. Um, today, last night, he started spiking temperatures. White count went up. Respiratory rate has gone up again. CRP has gone up. Ferritin has gone up from 1,000 to 3,000. d dimer that initially was at four came down to one has now gone back up to three. So is this sepsis? Is this a cytokine storm? Difficult to say, but we've done blood cultures. We've done all these things. And then we decided that maybe this is the beginning of the cytokine storm. And so far the only data that is out there is try and give maybe an interleukin-6 blocker will help. Luckily, we have some on hand that we're able to source from India, and uh, we have given it to him this morning. Um, these drugs, they're difficult to pronounce, but this is tocilizumab that we gave him, and we gave 600 uh, milligrams of it this morning. And then um, there's also some evidence, but still being studied at alpha blockers might help in blocking the cytokine storm. So he has hypertension. We decided to put him on, um, on um, an alpha blocker, prazosine. Uh, prazosine. And we're giving him low doses of that to control his blood pressure and hopefully block, block the cytokine surge that seems to be starting. 
so this is what we've been dealing with. I hope uh, I made sense because I tend to be, uh, my brain doesn't go in a straight line. Um, the other thing is all our colleagues abroad tell us there is secondary bacterial infection. So treat with broad spectrum antibiotics. So what we do is we start with uh, safe triaxone. And then if they start to spike a fever or show other signs of infection, we add a meropenem. Now we don't know what we are treating. Most of the time the blood cultures to come back negative. We've been advised for the safety of the lab technicians not to use sputum culture so they don't get infected. Uh, trying to work with the sputum. So you treat blindly with broad spectrum antibiotics. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But in this uh, patient we're talking about now, we've added meropenem. We have uh, started the monitor looking six and uh, we are hoping not to go by way of ventilation because we all know the prognosis once you get it onto the ventilation uh, side of things can be, it is bad. We don't know if vent is doing the damage, but if you don't put them on a ventilator, they don't make it. You put them on a ventilator, they don't make it. So you're in a catch 22. Until we learn more about this disease, um, we'll keep uh, trying to see what, um, what can be done. So in a nutshell, that is our experience at first cardiology. I'm not sure what the format is, if there'll be questions right now or after this, but um, that is my presentation in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. Uh, that was very, very, very um, uh, enlightening. And it was really important that we heard what we could do or not do in this environment. Um, I'm going to throw the floor open for questions. Um, those who are on Zoom should please type their questions into the chat. And are there questions from the house? Please write them down as we did. Um, at the end then. Any other questions? Dr. Johnson is going to get some questions and then read them to you so that you can um, answer them together. Um, Dr. Johnson, there's a question here. Is lymphopenia a marker of severity? Is, did I get the question right? Is lymphopenia a matter of severity? Marker. Marker. Yes. Sorry. Marker. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, I did mention that, yes. Um, interestingly, many of the patients who survived and went home came with lymphopenia and lymphopenia improved and pretty much resolved. They got better. So it's one of the markers that things are not good. So when you get severe lymphopenia, especially an absolute lymphocyte count, that's very low. It's not a good sign. So yes, and four out of the five patients that died had severe lymphopenia. One had a normal lymphocyte count, but had an elevated total white count. We thought it was just general sepsis, bacterial sepsis that uh, uh, 
cause the demise of that particular patient. But the other ones where you couldn't tell whether or not it was a bacterial infection, they were all severely lymphopenic and also at the same time developed thrombocytopenia. Uh, thank you. Then, do you think there is a direct correlation between the chest CT findings, positive diagnosis, and prognosis? Yes, certainly. At least in our experience, those that had mild CT scan changes, they all have this peripheral ground, ground, uh, ground glass pattern. Um, but when it occupies more than 60, 50, percent of the lungs, things can be very rough. They, they are very rough. You can tell that this one is not going to make it with just intranasal oxygen. And then you quickly find yourself going from nasal to non-rebreather to CPAP. And um, talking about CPAP, um, those of you who have ICUs, you don't need to be too worried about getting the CPAP machine. All the ventilators that I'm aware of have a CPAP mode. So you can connect the CPAP mask to the ventilator and set it on CPAP mode. And usually that will work without having to go to the expense of buying CPAP machines. Um, the next question, of the five patients who are yet to recover, how old were they when they came in? What was their CT picture? How long have, have they been on, on therapy? And what parameters are being used to monitor them? Let me go over that. Of the five yet to recover, how old were they, their age when they came in? Their CT pictures, their CAT scan. Um, how long have they been on therapy? and what parameters are being used to monitor them? Okay. Um, let me see. There are five with us now. Um, the sickest one is 70, uh, with diabetes and hypertension. Uh, he came in. All of them with us now have been with us for less than a week. Um, so they've all been with us less than a week. Two of those have severe CT scan findings, more than 50%. And um, one is on CPAP. That's when it looks like it's going into a cytokine storm. The other one has a bad CT scan. Is a lady. She's in her 50s. And she also has an autoimmune disorder for which she's on methotrexate and prednisolone. Her uh, rheumatology said stop the methotrexate while she is sick, and we just increased the dose of her prednisolone. Uh, and she's doing fairly well on two liters of oxygen. Main symptom is coughing. Uh, this um, intractable cough, which can be very disturbing, and it's really, uh, we're going to try some codeine um, containing drugs today and see if that will help. Uh, so those two have bad CT scan findings. The other three, uh, okay. One that uh, just came in two days, looks like it's a stroke. And uh, COVID, the COVID findings are what I call moderate. He is just on two liters of oxygen, but he's had signs of a significant stroke. Uh, his CT scan initially was normal. We're going to try and get an MRI today and see. He is doing fairly well other than the stroke. Um, one is likely to go home today. We're waiting for a negative, um, negative um, PCR test, which we should get the results back today. He came in with shortness of breath and uh, has improved. And the third one was going to go, I mean, the last one. So they're all these ones are all in their 50s. Only one in the 70s, who's 70. And the last one was fine. Respiratory symptoms went away. CT scan was mild, then developed renal failure. And he's 70. Developed renal failure, not to the point of dialysis, but creatinine went up to four. It's come back down to 3.4 today. 
So what do we use to monitor them? Routine things. You check the fight. They're all on a um, cardiac monitor. So we see their heart rate, blood pressure. If you are somebody who who's, requires more than two liters of oxygen, like a non-rebreather line, we put in an arterial line. So that way we don't have to stick you all the time for blood gases. Uh, so we use the blood gas to monitor the pulse oximeter to monitor, depending on the severity of the patient. So it's routine cardiac monitor, into arterial line, pulse oximetry, and those that require it, blood gas. Once you're on CPAP, you get at least two blood gases a day. And if you're very ill, we do the blood gas uh, according to your clinical status. I hope I, yes, I think I got around most of the questions. Very much. You have some more questions. Uh, considering the risk of splashes using nasal cannulae, is the non-rebreather mask not safer to start with in our environment? That's question one. Question two. In some series, an improvement in patients with ground glass appearance in their long CT was noticed in patients who had moderate um, who had moderate doses of corticosteroids, corticosteroids, thereby postulating that the lung damage is immune mediated. What is your experience along this line? And a third question. If, look, if, if there are too many, I will forget to. Okay, sorry. I'm just going to give you a third one. But okay. You, stop there. You, you can stop and then ask after this. Uh, let me ask, answer these two ones so I don't lose. Yes, the nasal cannula and the high flow nasal cannula. Yes, they aerolicize this, uh, they cause more aerolicization. So, yes, for sure, it's more risky to the staff. So, for those reasons, we um, everybody who is working in the ICU has full PPE, the full regalia. And um, to to at least protect them because we assume that this is, uh, you're going to get a rosalization of um, droplets. But on the other hand, we have these large filters beside the patients. So we have two in each, um, two big uh, filters that filter the air. So we try and keep it safe. Now, non rebreather mask uses a lot of oxygen, number one. So it's expensive to you put everyone in a non rebreather mask. So that's why we, we go with the nasal cannula. And we assume the virus is in the air and everybody has to protect themselves accordingly. Um, CT scan. You know, this is something that gives, keeps me awake at night. When do you give steroids? Because as we all know, steroids given at the wrong time can make things worse. So the question is, when do you give steroids? It's difficult to say. We are still grappling with that at first cardiology. Um, I'm beginning to think. I do not know if I have any evidence to support me that after the first five to seven days, the infection itself is over, and they were now dealing with the immune mediated damage. I think it is safe to give steroids then, but then I'm not sure. So there's this paralysis that we have that look, should we give steroids? Should we give? And then by the time we decide to give steroids, usually by then, uh, things are already far, far gone. So we're debating, researching as much as possible, reading all the literature there is there, but there's no consensus on when to give steroids. There's a consensus that steroids at the right time will help. When is the right time, I don't know. I think those are two questions you asked me. If leukopenia is a marker of severity, of what relevance is it in an asymptomatic patient? And then this question, is there a correlation between the clinical features and radiological findings in bracket, more express, expressly plain X-ray findings? Plain X-ray, not CT. 
Okay. Um, I do not have too much experience with the asymptomatic patients. We treat the sick ones. Um, so I, I can't tell you from my own personal experience what leukopenia and asymptomatic patient means. I really don't know. I haven't studied that. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to give a, an answer that um, has any um, validity to it. So I don't know. Now, correlation with chest X-ray. You know, that's an interesting question because it's interesting. Those with mild changes on CT scan, mild to moderate, sometimes the X-ray doesn't show anything, at least that you could see. Um, it's a very quite interesting. And then we do long ultrasound on everybody. And you see somebody whose X-ray looks fine, but the long ultrasound doesn't. And we've seen a correlation with long ultrasound CT scan and uh, prognosis in our own um, little um, series. So yes, the uh, chest x-ray hasn't helped us that much, except when it is very, very bad, then it is clear. But the mild to moderate ones, it's really difficult to tell. It really is difficult because the findings are on the periphery. So it's not that clear on the x-ray. Um, but the long ultrasound does help and the CT scan, of course, uh, does help. a lot of people asking questions and, and, and I think we still have about five minutes. So I'll ask, what is the average length of stay of your patients? That's one. Then from one week, then do you have specific parameters for grading severity of the disease? If so, would it be possible to correlate severity with duration of hospital stay and subsequent mortality? Um, one more question. You, you might have to write. I just have two more questions, I think. What is your experience with cardiac complications? And then, and then any attempts at post-mortem? And okay. how soon are these uh, autopsies done? Okay, I can answer those last two questions. <laughs> What? I have no experience with post-mortem. Um, I spoke to a colleague yesterday from a badon who told me, she's an ID specialist, said 100% guarantee no post-mortem in the badon. I do not know about Lagos, but it would really help us clinically if we could get post-mortem later. Um, she told me for sure no post-mortem going on in the badon when you see it. And that's 100% guaranteed, which I think is a shame because we can learn a lot. We can really learn a lot from these patients if we did post-mortem, but no. Um, you see, I've forgotten the rest now. Oh, cardiac complications. You know, you'd think that because we're in cardiology, we would see all the cardiac complications, but the cardiac findings we have seen are in the patients who are not so sick. We've gotten pericarditis, we've had myocarditis, uh, we've had pericardial effusion, but all those patients are, are not that sick. They're not in the ICU. They're outpatients. Um, in the ICU, all the patients who died, all, had normal echo findings. So we haven't seen the uh, cardiac uh, presentation of these cases. The other two questions I forgot to. of disease. If so, Sorry, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear what you said just now. With, dura oh, with duration of hospital stay and subsequent mortality, specific parameters oh. for grading severity of disease, and if so, would it be possible to correlate severity with duration of hospital stay and subsequent mortality? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Um, when they come in, going straight to CPAP or starting from um, a non rebreather mask and rapidly escalating to CPAP to a ventilator, length of stay is usually at minimum two weeks. And uh, the length of stay is directly related to mortality. The longer the patient stays, the higher the chances of 
a bad outcome. So that is for certain. So bad CT scan uh, requiring a lot of support from the onset usually indicates long um, duration of stay. Very frustrating because they go up and down. They look like they're improving, then they get bad. Improving, then get bad. So it's very traumatic emotionally for all of us. Uh, so yes, the longer the length of stay, the worse the prognosis. Although we did have a patient that we knew would make it as soon as they came, we saw the CT scan, all white, check X-ray, all white, already had renal failure. That person didn't last uh, 48 hours, but that was obvious, not just because of COVID, but because of the clinical um, scenario. Okay, um, and finally, um, just two things. What is your entry points criteria, the admission criteria, and your risk assessment for admission? And finally, was there a vitamin D level below which the below which was consistently associated with mortality? Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, vitamin D. Yes, uh, vitamin D level below 20 uh, was associated with bad outcome. Um, in all our all our um, mortality cases, um, all that left the hospital had vitamin D levels above twenty. So that's one line that is there. I mean, and that's this is a short series, so you can't take too. I don't think vitamin D causes or has anything to do. With it. I think it's just a reflection of your immune status. Our risk assessment, discharge criteria first is not too difficult. They've got to be asymptomatic, so have improved clinically, one. No longer requiring oxygen. We don't send anybody home on oxygen. So one is asymptomatic, at least to a significant degree. Some still have some diarrhea, so minor things like that. Sometimes it's the retrovirus that gives them the diarrhea. But asymptomatic, now we do a couple of things. Uh, we have to have a negative test going home. So what we do, we have our own in-house uh, antigen test that we use. Uh, and we're also using that to help us understand the disease. We have the antigen and antibody test, which we use to help understand what we're good doing. And uh, we have found out that patients can become antigen negative by our rapid test, but still PCR positive. So we keep them till the PCR is, is negative. So what we do is we don't repeat the PCR till the antigen is negative, uh, because the PCR is is a you know it doesn't come back immediately and uh, I think it's a lot more expensive. So what we do is we do the antigen test. Once it's negative, we wait two days, three days, then do the PCR, yeah. and then that usually comes down negative, and then we feel yeah. safe to let the patients go home. Interestingly, though, there's a couple of patients with moderate CT scan abnormalities who got better negative PCR, negative everything, went home, then four or five days later started to cough. Not sure why, but then they started to cough. But we don't have the outpatient uh, facility to treat COVID, so we didn't have the opportunity to repeat their CT scan and things like that. But um, we've noticed that in a couple of patients, they start to cough after they've gone home, after everything else seems to have resolved. Now it might be a good idea to get a CT scan on everybody when they go, but you know, these things start to get expensive when you repeat them. And uh, the places that have CT scans aren't always keen on looking, looking at our patients. And the entry criteria is they need ICU care. Now that is not a very rigid uh, thing. Um, it's all clinical. The patient is sick, it requires oxygen. That's usually what uh, brings them into the ICU. They're sick, they require oxygen or they're hypotensive. And we have to get permission from the state that look, this person is here, and we don't want to clog up our ICU with our patients who are walking around uh, fine, because it's not fair to a sick patient who might need a bed. So they've got to be at least requiring oxygen to come in. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson, thank you very much. You are, I'm about to let you go, but I think there's a question I think people need to have an answer. And it's a very simple one. Are there highly suggestive signs and symptoms of COVID-19 that 
are peculiar to our environment, that if you see a combination of these, be very suspicious. Or it's just like everybody else. Well, I don't know how everybody else is or all around the world. Um, I do know this. Uh, once I get a call that somebody is being treated for typhoid and malaria and they're not getting better, it is almost always COVID. And um, the one thing I've seen is fever is not a constant. Fever is not a constant. The constant I have seen with patients who come and were unable to take is they don't feel well. They just don't feel well. And they're elderly people. Once an elderly person gets sick, doesn't feel well, it's not clear what they have, but they have body aches. They say it's like malaria, but it's not malaria. I haven't seen one that is not COVID yet. I haven't seen one. And the elderly people don't tend to get the fever. The young ones tend to get the fever. The elderly ones don't tend to get it. And the elderly ones, they have all been at home since March. They haven't gone anywhere. But since the lockdown was eased up, they've got house help and uh, drivers coming in. And I think that's where they get it from. But they don't feel well. And uh, I can tell you that the private hospitals are seeing these patients. They don't have all the testing facilities. So they first treat thinking it's malaria, and uh, then they find out the patient's not improving, and they find out it's COVID. So it's, I think anybody these days presenting with signs and symptoms of malaria, especially elderly people, uh, you've got to think of COVID. Dr. Johnson, thank you very much. I think I can say that on behalf of everybody that this has been extremely useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. We will be calling on you more, so keep your eyes on your series right there, so that we can ask you in a, in a few months' time to give us more updates on what you're finding. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.